Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to Cinema in Conversation. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, this is going to be a really exciting presentation, I think. You're going to like it. Uh, so we're, today we're going to talk about a movie that I bet you didn't think would ever be the subject of scholarly analysis, Wonder Woman. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce our guest, Kathleen Rowe Carlin. Kathleen is the author of the award-winning book, The Unruly Woman, Gender and the Genres of Laughter and Unruly Girls, Unrepented Mothers, which I had to return to the library, <laughs> and numerous articles on film, television, genre, feminist theory, and cultural studies. She is Professor Emerita at the University of Oregon and was, found, and, and was the founding director of its program in cinema studies. And she now resides in Philadelphia, where she continues to read, write, and give lectures on popular film and television. So I'm sure we're gonna have a lot of questions uh, throughout the talk. So make sure to drop your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to them after the lecture. All right, so Kathleen, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Julia, and hello, everybody. Um, I, I'm just really happy to be here and happy to have a chance to talk with you. Um, uh, this is the subject of the talk. It's going to be a little bit all over the map. Um, my first order of business is to try to get my uh, share the screen with you. And um, I have a PowerPoint. I'm um, a, a little tech anxious. So let's get this thing up. And then I will start actually um, getting into, into this talk. So let me try this and um, see you on the screen. Okay, I'm a little ahead of myself here, so. Uh, okay. Um, there we go. This talk, I'm going to be talking uh, um, about several things tonight and actually putting together um, thoughts about the context of Wonder Woman, about my own research uh, and, and um, my response to the film and a whole lot of things that have been happening in the culture um, for the past five or so years. Um, the main subject of the talk really is about the issue of powerful women and how the culture, our culture feels about powerful women. Um, what genres are available to tell the stories of powerful women, and I'm going to be moving between representation, film, television, and so on, and the real world, because um, a lot of the conventions, a lot of the ways we think the stories we tell about powerful women, really, there's a lot of overlapping between the two. And I'm also going to be talking about women's tears, um, how women and audiences in general, but in particular, um, this overflowing uh, overflowing of emotion that happened around many, many things that happened in the last five or six years. So, um, okay. And I also want to say uh, this, I'm primarily going to be talking about the first Wonder Woman and Hillary Clinton. Um, but also there has been another Wonder Woman, um, 84, and a whole series of films that I want to just kind of put on the table as context for, um, for these Wonder Woman films. And I'm calling them this genre called the revenge of the oppressed. And that's about the films that are dealing, it's a whole rash of them globally, about the voices of groups of people who have been silenced and oppressed. Um, many of these films use genres like the superhero film or the action film or horror to reach audiences and give expression to um, the silenced voices of, of groups of people. Some of them are utopian, like Wonder Woman, some of them are dystopian, and I would say like Michaela Cohen's um, I May Destroy You, 
is a dystopian um, or it's a darker version of, of um, the voice of the oppressed. But some of the others, the most obvious one um, is Black Panther. That is very, very similar for um, African-American audiences. About a year after Wonder Woman came out, the same kind of epic, powerful impact in the culture, again, appropriating the genre of the superhero um, in order to appropriating it, recoding it in order to make a message, create a message about justice and to put images, bodies, faces, narratives on the screen that otherwise had not been available. Um, in the same sort of genre, I've been watching the boys on television, um, Get Out, Us, Jordan Peele, again, horror re being rewritten for political purposes, Sorry to Bother You, um, Outside of This Country, Parasite, uh, Snowpiercer earlier, um, uh, genres, uh, films that deal with colonialism, again, the revenge of the oppressed, Baccarat, wonderful Brazilian film, Aquarius, White Tiger, some of these titles may be familiar to you. And in the terms of gender, um, I May Destroy You, A Promising Young Woman, Undoing on Television, um, all kind of putting these points of view on the screen that had normally not been there. So, okay, let's backtrack a little bit um, to 2016 and 17. And um, I, as I say, I'll be reading part of this and uh, reading part of it and talking as well. And let me, sh um, here is a very evocative image um, that was in my local newspaper uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's an image that almost would have been unthinkable at the end of the election when Hillary Clinton lost. So this speaks to both the kind of miraculous sense that there's a woman of color who is occupying uh, a high office in this land after um, a kind of crushing defeat just four years ago. Um, and again, appropriating the, the imagery of Wonder Woman, which kind of speaks to the power of this imagery um, as uh, kind of a cultural um, symbol of, of women's power. So, okay, four years ago and farther back than that, monsters, we'll see many references to monsters tonight, magic, and um, here I can put those, uh, those magic bracelets, um, the desire for power, but also a certain yearning for purity in the um, use of that power. And then the reality of dirt, what happens when you do get out there and use power? So um, is purity even possible? What is the problem with searching for purity? And then tears. Um, women audiences have long ridden the range of emotions associated with these images and themes, but that ride or that uh, that ride went into hyper hyperdrive uh, with Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Tears, and I've I've always been interested in films, television, any kind of cultural event that moves people or pushes their buttons, especially those associated with female unruliness, um, which is a cluster of attributes that can both celebrate but also demonize women who seek power. And I'm going to go deeper into this notion of the unruly woman a little bit farther into this talk. In the late 80s and 90s, it was Roseanne Barr who was pushing buttons. She polarized her audiences uh, and she giving an unvarnished feminist perspective on working class life. Of course, her history, I don't want to go into what's happened with her now, but this was an example of a very powerful, uh, a woman who had a lot of power and um, also had a polarizing effect on audiences from the beginning. By the mid 90s, girl culture uh, and its popularity among young women also had polarizing um, texts that um, really kind of spoke strongly to young girls and women, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Scream, Titanic, um, but their mothers were not so happy about these, these texts. And that kind of opened up these rifts or tensions within feminism between the second wave of feminism that was my feminism and the third wave. Um, and this was a very productive tension because um, it, it, uh, it, once again, these popular texts became kind of catalysts for conversations that moved the movement forward. In the years around two, uh, the 2016 campaign, um, 
I, I, so yeah, I, I said another film I was also interested in was American Beauty. Similarly, um, a, a, a sort of a backlash film um, that I wrote about uh, also um, not as a feminist film, but as a film that represented a kind of backlash to some of the um, the, the gains that that women were claiming in in um, our culture. So anyway, in the in the last five or six years, two female figures really became, gained a lot of prominence in the culture. One one fiction and um, one uh, a real person, Wonder Woman and uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton. If Clinton's defeat was a shock, so too was the triumph of Patty Jenkins' Wonder Woman. Triumph in box office, among critics, and with female audiences around the world. Women were crying about it in droves, and I wanted to know why. Um, and I had a connection with this film as well. Um, Patty Jenkins' sister had been my student at Oregon. She's now a professor in Indiana and a wonderful, wonderful woman. So I knew Wonder Woman was in the works for some years before it was actually um, released. So in the months that followed um, the election, I found more occasions for tears, from mass shootings that had become numbingly routine in our country to the snarky responses to what happened, Clinton, which was Clinton's account of her run for the presidency. In the fall of 2017, with the exposure of film mogul Harvey Weinstein's decades of sexual abuse, Me Too went global displaced from its more intractable target in the White House and toppling more or at least tainting powerful men in virtually every, every institution of our society. And that of course is continuing in the news this very day um, with the, the governor of New York. And while the battle between Trump and Clinton technically ended with Clinton's defeat, it not only continued in Trump's post-election obsession with her, but escalated in the massive mobilization of women and other minority groups newly politicized by the Trump's uh, presidency. My thoughts about these emotions were influenced by two conversations I was having many times during that period. The first, in discussing the election with friends, many of them men, um, I often hit a wall and, and it, it, it hit around this issue of, well, I just don't like Hillary. She's just not likable. Why did she accept money from Goldman Sachs? Why, did, why didn't she tell off Trump? And, and women as well had this reaction. Why did she stay with Bill? At this, and at the same time, when I saw Wonder Woman and really loved it, I had similarly, um, uh, unsatisfying conversations with a lot of a lot of my feminist friends. Um, I had a fairly uncomplicated um, response of, of pleasure in this film, but a lot of feminist film critics had a certain skepticism as they often have about the popular. Um, again, wanting more, they wanted something pure from this film. Why was Wonder Woman not more feminist? Um, uh, and I'm going to quote film scholar, or she's a historian, Jill Lepore in The New Yorker. I am not proud that I found comfort in watching a woman in a golden tiara and thigh high boots clobber hordes of terrible men, but I did. So again, there was a sense of more, I want more, I want more, this is just not as good as it can be. This desire for more reveals a deeper yearning for a kind of purity and a frustration with the reality of compromise that confronts anyone but especially a woman who aspires to direct a blockbuster buster film as Patty Jenkins did, or to rise to the pinnacle of political power. In other words, to be unruly, to act in a big way on her desire. The burden is heavy and the risks are very real for anyone who is a first and who refuses to play by the rules. Now, I'm not interested in defending Hillary Clinton or the campaign or even um, Wonder Woman as a film, but I am interested in what the intense responses to both have in common and how those responses are tied to the conventions of uh, female unruliness that I explored and I uh, explored throughout my academic career. First, um, I, earlier I was more interested in laughter, the genres of laughter than in women's tears, which to me seemed too much about victimization and suffering. And comedy saved me a lot during these recent years. Um, uh, Samantha B, whose rage I found completely um, and humor, very, very 
cathartic. But this was a time of tears for me too, all kinds of tears. And I know I was not alone. While I was researching this, uh, this paper, um, I was interested in finding out more about the different kinds of tears we shed. And I came upon this, you know, as with the Eskimo story about how many, there's so many different kinds of snow. Well, there are many, many kinds of tears as well. Physical tears triggered when you peel onions or tears of joy or tears of grief. The numbers of tears are immensely varied. And this book, I think, is just quite beautiful. These are uh, that the author, took photographs of her own tears that she shed on different occasions in her own life, put them under a microscope and photographed them. And I thought that connection between kind of the microscopic look at tears was connected. They look almost like global geological formations. And this suggested to me the connection between um, the, the larger social structures we live in and the way our bodies respond to them. And I say these tears, whether triggered by Wonder Woman or Hillary Clinton's defeat um, or the shared trauma of sexual abuse, um, they suggest more emotion than our bodies can hold inside or that our words can convey. So there's something extremely powerful about this spilling over of tears on these very varied occasions that to me says we need to pay attention to what is going on with them. Um, so here are a few occasions. I was caught off guard by tears a number of times in uh, during these um, during this period of intense emotion. Maybe the first one was I was I drove to Washington DC the day after Trump's inauguration and I was in a car with friends and the highways were full of caravans of buses cheering. Everybody was going to the same place and I was overwhelmed. I was just caught up with emotion. Um, and what I found there was this exhilarating um, expression of, I mean, the, the march was not perfect. We all know that. Um, it reflected the problems that continued to plague feminism, uh, racial problems, class privilege, and so on. But I felt, I felt uh, a, a, in that event, this kind of combination of political activism and street theater comedy, carnival, shared laughter, um, joy in just being together in solidarity that uh, made me experience a sense of, of uh, sanity and solidarity in a world that seemed to have gone cuckoo. And in this little image here, Daria, I don't know whether any of you remember, she was a wonderful animated character, feminist, very sardonic. And um, I, you know the, this, this was a, a tremendous event for me and for obviously for others. As uh, soon after I went to a theater and um, watched Woman, Wonder Woman, and of course being able to watch it in a theater, uh, which we all, we all miss, um, we, all, we all know as film lovers, we all know the power of a big screen, a shared audience, a great sound system to amplify the effect of a film. But I was not prepared to be so completely blown away as I was by the film. And um, two, two moments in the film, I'm going to show you these clips, just caught me off guard. And I talked to so many women who said the same thing. Women who grabbed the hands of people sitting next to them, just utterly overwhelmed by, um, by this this flood of emotion. The two, moment, uh, two moments especially thrilled me. In the first, Diana, as a little girl, takes a warrior pose that shows her fighting spirit and determination to have her way. In the second, as an adult, she again defies those who oppose her and storms across no man's land, warding off a barrage of bullets uh, with her magic bracelets. So let's take a look at these um, just to refresh your memory. And again, these were just, I was not alone in, uh, as I researched this paper, these were the scenes that, uh, you know, these, this is an action movie. And actually uh, for me, the, the young girl showing so much spirit and then the power of, of, a, of an adult woman, um, the, the power of a body in action and the bravery and courage. Um, this is fantasy, but deeply touching real deep emotions in, in women worldwide. So, okay, first one. Hello, Diana. <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, and then let's see the the second one. Oops. That what is the matter? This is no man's land, Diana. It means no man can cross it, all right? This battalion has been here for nearly a year, and they, they barely gained an inch, all right? Because on the other side, there are a bunch of Germans pointing machine guns at every square inch of this place. This is not something you can cross. It's not possible. So what? So we do nothing? No, we, do, we are doing something. We are. We just... We can't save everyone in this war. This is not what we came here to do. It's what I'm going to do. Yeah, um, I'm not a fan, not normally a fan of this kind of an action movie, but this this was um, obviously very moving in the big theater and so on. Um, at the same time, it, shortly after Wonder Woman came out, Clinton released her memoir in, in 2017. And this was not an occasion for tears of Wonder Woman tears. But I did not weep, but I felt a smoldering rage at the way her book was received. Um, and uh, some of the, um, she was basically the reaction, the response to her book was, and I, and I have, I can say more about that in just a little bit, but why doesn't she just shut up and go away? The, uh, the campaign is over, she lost, go away. And there was a, a very widespread, very ungenerous and um, 
I, I thought a, a, a sexist reaction to her memoir um, that happened at about the same time as this one. Both of these occasions, Wonder Woman's unruliness is tempered because she's a fictionalized character packaged for a mass audience. Clinton's, however, is more threatening because she's a real person. She sought and, uh, and has held real power in the real world. And in addition, she is and she has age, which um, uh, to quote, I think it was, um, oh, I can't remember, Amy, Amy um, Poehler and uh, I'm forgetting the other one, past the age of fuckability, which codes her even more with unruliness and the grotesque. Both of these women, both Wonder Woman and Hillary Clinton, push, uh, they challenge, they push at cultural beliefs of what a woman can and should do or be. Both remind us that if we choose action here, um, both remind us if we choose action over passivity, which is the preferred mode of femininity, we may have to compromise to get our hands dirty and maybe even engage in violence. Buffy the Vampire Slayer killed a few vampires in her quest to save the world. Both Wonder Woman and Clinton ask us also to consider what narrative genres are available to tell the stories of women who comply or who combine action and power. Can you still imagine these women only as superheroes like Wonder Woman or as monsters as Hillary Clinton was ultimately perceived to be? Can we imagine women's power only in the realm of fantasy? I've long uh, admired Latina actor America Ferrara for her performances in uh, Patricia Cardoso's wonderful film, Real Women Have Curves, and ABC's Ugly Betty. And my admiration for her has only grown in an interview she did with Hillary Clinton in September of 2017. In it, she suggests some of the emotions behind the tears uh, that attended um, Wonder Woman. And let me read you this quote. As a woman, as a Latina, I've always felt there's a very narrow version of me that's acceptable, that's allowed to succeed. And if I stray from that, I'm not just failing myself, I'm failing too many. And so I've operated from a place of fear, not from my most alive self. I think Ferrara here identifies that mixture of emotions activated by both Wonder Woman and Clinton, the frustration of having to shrink ourselves into narrower versions of who we are in order to be successful. The fear, shame, and even violence women risk when they violate the constraints imposed on us. The sense of responsibility to others if we aspire to do or be something more, a theme that Clinton returns to repeatedly in her book. And finally, that yearning to be our most alive selves, something many women, I suspect, have experienced first through the power of cinematic identification with the narrative and character they had not encountered before when they saw Gal Gadot on the screen living uh, as a kind of figure of identification, emotions that they may had never had even imagined for themselves. So I've had other experiences of being caught off guard by tears. And this is just from um, several examples from my own history. Um, uh, one of them, and this is taking us a little bit back in ter terms of the, um, again, women, wonder, the wonder women of past history. The first one, I was working at a newspaper at the time, and um, Geraldine Ferraro had just been nominated to, she was just accepting the nomination for uh, to run as vice president. Um, uh, and I saw her, I, everybody stopped work. We looked at the television, it was on in the newsroom. And I, when I saw her on that screen, again, I just got caught up with tears. I had never seen a woman surrounded by men in this kind of position of power. She too, and here you can see um, this historic nature of her candidacy recognized there and her depiction combining femininity, patriotism, and power. Very, very rare. It was a, a watershed moment 
for women in the country. Um, like Hillary, also her candidacy was derailed because of her, because she was married to a guy who had a shady, she had a shady history and his business dealing, she was tainted by um, his business dealings and had to step down. Um, the second, there were other occasions for me too, um, hearing Susan Stamberg's voice, first time I heard a woman on the radio, first time I stepped into an airplane and there was a woman in the cockpit piloting this giant plane. And then another enormously important moment, which anticipates the Me Too movement, and this is Anita Hill's testimony um, before the Senate. Um, her story was so powerful, and you know, anticipated the, the bravery of the women who subsequently came forward to tell stories and take a public position. Also humiliated, shamed, um, uh, brutalized by uh, the, the Senate that interrogated her at the time. Um, so these women, it's it's really easy to make a case for why the stories of these women are important. Um, but then to go back into fictional stories, making the case for why do we take women in fiction seriously? And I was inspired in my work on Wonder Woman by a, a colleague of mine, Jacqueline Bobo, um, who did something similar when the Color Purple came out. And again, The Color Purple was a film that was widely recognized among, uh, among everybody, but especially among Black audiences for um, the, the way Alice Walker's novel was distorted for a popular audience. There were racist aspects to this film, and yet Black women loved it. Jackie Bobo is a Black woman. She did ethnographic research into these audiences. And just as the women responding to Wonder Woman were something real, these are real people responding in very real ways to representation. These women were responding to the image of seeing um, a, a, a face that was like theirs, of seeing Whoopi Goldberg on the screen in this um, in this very powerful mo uh, move, uh, movie. And again, the power of cinematic identification representation cannot be underestimated. The power of a, of a big audience and Spielberg to his credit knows how to do that. I'm here, which was the assertion of presence that um, the uh, Seeley, the character in The Color Purple, makes. And, and in many ways, the audiences who love this film, despite the critical, uh, the criticisms of the film, or insisting as audiences, I'm here, take me seriously. Take, you know, take my reaction to this seriously. I deserve a place in this culture. Okay, so that reading, that analysis um, was very influential in my own work in terms of looking at how audiences, many film theor theorists and critics, um, kind of get caught up in a theoretical abstract audience. And I do too. It's wonderful to theorize how people respond to films, but we can never lose fact or lose sight of the fact that real people are watching these movies and reacting to them. And as I said earlier, Black Panther, a very, very similar um, response in, in, in important importance in the culture to have um, this, uh, a Black body, a Black man represented in a narrative like that. And the film also had, um, for the first time, um, had a, a huge impact. Okay, back to Wonder Woman. And I'm not going to do an exhaustive history of Wonder Woman. I guess I'll just go through some of these slides here. I love this. This is the first um, one, Ms. Magazine, which was, um, as the women's movement was getting underway, um, Ms. Magazine was a popularized feminist ideas uh, in the mainstream. And interestingly, um, I see this cover, first cover of, of Ms. Magazine with Wonder Woman, the, um, Wonder Woman for President. So already even the kind of um, semiotic link between Wonder Woman and Hillary Clinton running for president. Um, 45 years later, resisting, persisting, still, still, um, uh, you know, the image and recognizing again, women um, fighting the patriarchy, the battle continuing to go on. Um, all of both of these women embody this notion or theory that, that I uh, worked on that I describe as female unruliness. And this is a collection of tropes or conventions that are very popular in um, comedy uh, and the grotesque and the carnivalesque uh, figures like Roseanne, like um, 
uh, you know, very popular in comedy. Um, but, and these, these are attributes that are ambivalent. They can be positive or they can be negative depending on the context. But what they are is they're powerful. Here are some of them. There are a lot of them. The, the unruly woman refuses to submit or defer to men. Um, her body is often excessive fat, suggesting her unwillingness or inability to control her physical appetites. Her speech is excessive in quantity, content, or tone. And um, we, hear, we hear this a lot, um, and I have more examples of it, of, especially with Hillary Clinton. Nobody liked her voice. Nobody liked how she laughed. Um, thresholds. Uh, um, a creature that violates boundaries between male, female. We'll see this in some images coming up. Male, female, animal, human. That boundary space is always very charged, very powerful. And the unruly woman is very comfortable in that place of boundaries. Um, she makes jokes often about men and uses laughter to unite women, as we saw at that um, the, the uh, Women's March on Washington, often androgynous um, to draw attention to the social construction of gender. So um, Wonder Woman as a superhero in the genre of superhero, she's hyper feminine, but that's how superheroes are hyper masculine, hyper feminine. Um, so uh, these are just some of them. The most important of all is the woman as subject is claiming her own desire. And we see this certainly with Wonder Woman and Hillary both saying, I am going to do this. You are not going to tell me I can't. I am going to do this. This is what I want to do. Okay, now, as I say, these, these are coded with misogyny. They can be used in very negative ways as well, but an unruly woman can tap into their potential to disrupt the existing social order by embracing them and recoding them. Okay, so let me um, talk a little bit about some of the antecedents of our Wonder Woman here. Um, and I'm, I'll move fairly quickly through this. Um, uh, the first one, the most famous Wonder Woman before um, Patty Jenkins one was Linda Carter, um, kind of campy, um, much more nationalistic. She did a little cameo at the end of Wonder Woman 84. Um, as I say, hyper-feminized, hyper-sexualized, um, which is sort of the case of um, so superheroes are exaggerated in their gender attributes. Um, often beautiful, uh, as Gal Gadot is, um, and these other uh, superheroes. So, um, there are a lot of noirish women uh, figures, female figures, who, unlike Wonder Woman, have are portrayed in a darkish, noir way, suggesting these are mostly directed by men, suggesting that a woman who aspires to power or has power is going to suffer, and she's tainted and wounded through her power. Um, this Xena warrior princess, um, which took some, I mean, it had a lesbian subtext, um, and she also had a darker, more conflicted background. Buffy the Vampire Slayer um, also suffering the one to um, save the generation and every generation what was born, suffering the darkness of, of a girl, female figure with power. Jessica Jones, alcoholic suffering. Um, all, all of these, what, what set um, what, what Patty Jenkins Wonder Woman ap apart was the kind of optimism of her vision. Um, the and I think part of the appeal of that film was we were living in a time of great cynicism and malaise and depression, and to have a uh, a figure that exuded optimism, um, love, uh, faith in humanity, the beauty of the world, I think was very healing, and that was another reason. Um, it, it, the film was so successful. Um, other, uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about Patty Jenkins here as who I also think is some kind of a Wonder Woman, a superwoman herself, having directed Wonder Woman. And there's so many statistics in um, available about how few women actually were given. She had the largest budget 
of a woman to direct a film. The film was immensely successful in every way, but it, it took 13 years from Monster, here's that word again, uh, the film about uh, Eileen Wuornos uh, based on a real, real person and a, a serial killer. And uh, Patty Jenkins was able to do a successful film um, about a, a, a female a serial killer. And she's canny enough to put a feminist um, framework around that, I think, which is, testifies to her, um, uh, her chops as a director and as a feminist. So um, this, um, can I, excuse me for galloping a little bit more through here, criticisms of the film. Let's talk about things that people criticized about it. And, and there's a lot of wonderful quotes. Um, but more the more of the positive ones that I thought were more telling were a uh, quote here again. I felt like I was discovering something I didn't even know I had wanted after three decades of watching Iron Man, Captain America, Superman, and Batman punching others in the face. Um, a lot of viewers will come to this film as I did after the most ordinary of days. Um, uh, punch card, punching, office meeting, kid raising, so on. Days of seeing women silenced, ignored, dismissed, threatened, undermined, underpaid, and underestimated and somehow taking it. Um, not everybody shared this, uh, the positive reviews. James Cameron, director of, uh, well-respected director of Terminator and the um, Alien and a number of other Titanic, thought it was a step back because Wonder Woman was beautiful and um, she was not um, in his view, he has a, he quoted uh, the real super, the real step forward for Hollywood was his, it was Linda Hamilton in The Terminator. And um, he said she was not a beauty icon. She was strong, she was troubled, she was a terrible mother and she earned the respect of the audience through pure grit. There was nothing sexual about her character. It was about angst. It was about determination. She was crazy. She was complicated. Well, there were, she got taken over the coals by the first Wonder Woman, Linda Carter and many others. The thing he got wrong, of course, was the mansplaining in um, kind of schooling Patty Jenkins and all these women who loved the film about what a female hero should be. Um, I, misstep uh, and, and a, a, bad, a bad move. I, uh, he's done some wonderful movies, but listen to these audiences and see the kind of hero they want. Maybe they don't want the troubled, terrible mother as a great uh, feminist icon. Um, some of the ways, the other things, uh, a couple of other things about this, um, I'm going to say here, just here, some of the things that Patty Jenkins did to make this a wonderful film for women was instead of sexualizing, um, she allowed the Wonder Woman to be feminine, um, but she played around with like, the, how she shot the film, reversed the, the female gaze. And instead of, she's a beautiful, the actress is beautiful, but instead of sexualizing her body, she switched it around. And I think it's almost a joke, but one a, a sort of a, a really amusing and fun joke to turn the male body into the object of the gaze. Um, and here is Linda, I mean, uh, these slides are a little bit out of order. Here's Linda Hamilton, um, James, Cam uh, James Cameron's idea of um, the, the perfect uh, hero for female audiences. Patty Jenkins used two genres in making this film. And one of them is the superhero film because that genre demands action. And conventional normative femininity says, you know, we're not supposed to, um, women are supposed to be passive. Preferred modes of femininity is to let the guys do the action. By choosing that genre, in order to conform to the conventions of the genre, the female has to act. And this is a great choice of a genre. The other one is a genre of romantic comedy, which is loaded with unruly women. Um, it's a genre that women love. And this genre is also present in the love story in the, in the Wonder, first Wonder Woman. Um, here's Catherine Hepburn and Cary Grant. Um, he's in jail. She's uh, <laughs> calling the shots, gets him out of jail. Um, and here is finally her uh, Patty Jenkins statement about the kind of hero she was trying to make. A hero who believes in love, filled with love, believes in change and the betterment of mankind. Art is supposed to bring beauty to the world. Now I'm going to shift gears and take us fairly quickly 
through some slides to show us how we deal with real women who seek that kind of power. We're no longer in the genre of the superhero, but the real world. Um, and there are some very um, distressing signs here of um, Hillary Clinton. Uh, these are images that from the dark, darkest corners of the web, um, but they show how the imagery of the grotesque is attached to these women here. Um, uh, I say the Hillary as grotesque. Um, these are images out of horror, but attached to Hillary, um, classic imagery of grotesque combining the human and the animal. Um, Michelle Obama, the deeply racist um, images here. Um, and there's a lot that could be said about how one of the ways to try to control women who seek power is to show them as masculine or manly. Um, and these are, as I say, deeply disturbing images, but this is the other side of the quest for female power and, and the way women are, uh, strong women are held back um, and, and controlled um, by the threat or fear of this kind of um, uh, demonization. And um, I'm, I'm going to move quickly through here at Trump's rallies. Uh, people dodged the question. I, I think the real people in the, the aftermath of the election, the dominant conversation was about class, about Hillary Clinton lost the election because she didn't address class. But I think the real unspoken truth was the the thing driving that election was both race and gender. Um, I think the racism drove voters to Trump and sexism drove them away from, uh, from Hillary. So here's a quick little synopsis of Hillary as, a, as an unruly woman from girlhood. Um, this is an image of the film election and uh, many people, this is a wonderful film, um, um, Many people see the character, the teenage character who is an ambitious high school girl as a prototype of, um, of Hillary Clinton in, in her ambition. And I, I think this is, a, a, a Reese Witherspoon is, a, I think, a wonderful actress, um, uh, always dealing with interesting characters. But here, what I love is the image of the mouth is a very unruly image because it is associated with appetite. Uh, it's associated with speech, and here devouring, it's another vagina dentata, um, the female devouring <clears throat> the man, even in the simple comedy of the film election. I do recommend this film if you haven't seen it. Later, Hillary, again, the monster trope, the motif, uh, firebrand already um, viewed as uh, a monster because she sought power, um, even as a young woman. Later, here's that mouth um, and in a more grotesque way here, um, monstrous images uh, trying again to demonize Hillary Clinton for her, um, her aspirations for power. Um, did you really think I was just going to go away? And again, this sort of thing circulating around when uh, the post-election period, when ma male candidates who were defeated became folkloric heroes, uh, commentators, they, people loved their memoirs. Hillary got nothing but just go away. We don't want to pay attention to you anymore. Um, so that is not a it's not a pleasant um, thing. And I might also mention in the current news, Nira Tandon um, now derailed because her tweets were so her voice, her mouth, her words uh, too unnerving, too unsettling. Um, the standards are different for women than for men, but the power of the female voice. Um, uh, again, female laughter was criminalized, almost criminalized at one point when somebody uh, a woman laughed at Jeff Sessions and was removed from uh, the chamber. Um, so, okay, um, I, I think I probably need to wrap this up a little bit um, because this has gone on so long. I want to end here with the, this wonderful, um, it, it's a wonderful quote here. Uh, Again, Hillary Clinton, America Ferreira, really modeling the kind of intergenerational, interracial feminism that 
I aspire to, I think we all should aspire to, and it kind of brings us back this quote here. Uh, Ferreira says, I want to be the biggest badass version of myself possible. Again, my fullest, most alive self to honor the lives of women like Hillary Clinton, like Gloria Steinem, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, to honor the sacrifices they made for women of my generation. Um, I think this uh, probably is, <laughs> is a good place to stop. Um, again, this is uh, an, an image of the power or, or juxtaposing these. I, I like this sense that um, uh, young girls, this is fantasy, this is utopian, but we mustn't discount the power of imagination when we go into the popular and go into even fantasy genres. In realism, this kind of story cannot be told in realism. In realism, women suffer, women live smaller lives, um, women's their desire is shrunk. We have to go into these fantasy genres often to create that um, utopian image of what might be. And also, I think we need to take seriously the pleasures of the popular that um, audiences get. There is something political in sharing laughter, in even sharing tears, and, and sharing um, a, a, an experience that moves us together with other people. So, I am going to stop and I would be um, delighted to hear questions. Let me get out of this thing. All right. Wow. Thank you so <laughs> much, Kathleen. That was so interesting. This is like so my jam and I'm like <laughs> totally on board with everything. <laughs> so yeah. So um if anybody has questions or thoughts or whatever, um, just drop them in the Q and A box, and we'll get to them. But so I was just thinking about um, the the genre, this genre, the revenge of the oppressed, yeah, genre, yeah. and I was wondering, it kind of made me wonder, like, what would that look like in an alternate universe? where men were the oppressed like what what kind of film would like elicit the same kind of reaction that i had to wonder woman in in a white man you know or 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 like the same thing like you know black panther like in an alternate universe where you know white people were were the oppressed like what what would that look like um and it, it kind of made me wonder like can can the non can the the non oppressed group ever kind of like tap into that really deep feeling? I I think if you are in power, it's really hard to imagine what it's like not to be in power. Um, and the, 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 if there's a little glimmer of it, it's the male melodrama victimization film, which started. I mean, I I, I mentioned American Beauty, but when men start to feel women encroaching on their power or white people start to feel black people encroaching on their power, whatever it is, queer, you know, cis people, straight people start to feel a little queer people are, then you get this different kind of film that is often, I mean, this is sort of the Trump narrative that um, I'm a victim, I'm suffering. I mean, he, the whole um, uh, narrative around Trump is very much the power white, male power um, feeling victimized. Um, if there's a genre, like the, the closest thing I can think of is a wonderful little, um, it's called Barbecue Area. It's a little fake documentary and set in Australia. It's just brilliant. And it shows the white people as a minority, Australia being discovered by Aborigines that come and place their flag. And it does a whole kind of ethnographic film. It's sent up of ethnographic, documentaries where white people are being subjected their strange habits their strange traditions they lock their old people up in these isolated homes you know they have these it, it, it is quite it's called barbecue area um but it is that sense of turning the tables and trying to ask powerful people to imagine what it would be like if they were themselves disempowered wow yeah that's fascinating I, yeah, it's, it's, um, it reminds me of, I, I forget if it was like a commercial or something that was going around the internet or something where 
it was like a day in the life of a high school student, like a, a high school boy. And he, and it was in this alternate universe of the women were, yeah. or maybe I'm conflating two things. I, I'm think, I think I'm thinking of a, a tampon commercial where it, like it was portrayed as like men getting their periods and like needing tampons and asking, you know, other men in the bathroom, like, oh, do you have a tampon? It just so just it really kind of blows your mind. It's a great example of what comedy can do and what you can do in comedy that you can't, again, you can't, comedy gives you a lot of latitude for um, kind of thought experiments and laughter that's charged laughter but it's kind of hidden a little bit inside the joke so and fantasy again um i i think those are great ideas i i would hope that young filmmakers are all over this idea and starting to create alter, you say alternative universes where the, the power relations are all turned upside down is that what you're you're suggesting Oops, are we frozen? Sorry, I think my internet might have cut out. What did I miss? <laughs> brave, brave world. It's a great idea, Julia. I, and I hope that there will be many films like that because they could be um, just super entertaining and provocative, enjoyable. Mike, did you have a, a question? No, I was just going to rescue you if you were frozen. But <laughs> um, I, I will share, um, you know, an, an email that we got during your talk, Kathleen. Um, I I'll, I'll preserve the anonymity of the person, but they, they said I was a year and a half into my male to female gender transition when Wonder Woman was released. I saw it 23 times in the theater. Um, the film has helped shaped me helped shape me and my own feminine power over my transition the film kept me alive um oh. the scene is so important to me and it represents an allegory for the challenges hurdles and hurts that i had to surmount as i learned grew and changed uh no question uh just wanted to say this and say thank you so um you know people really appreciate your perspective on this and, and we're really grateful for that Thank you for the person who sent that. Um, that is so affirmative. Uh, and I, I just thank you for sharing your experience. And um, I, I'm glad you found something so supportive in this narrative. That's wonderful. Oops. We're oh, silent. Sorry. Sorry, I think my internet keeps cutting out. Things keep, uh, things keep cutting out. Um, but uh, so, it, does anybody have uh, any other questions? You can drop them in the Q and A. Um, we have a question um, or more of a comment about Maud uh, from Norman Lear. I think this was when we were talking about um, the unruly woman, the the excess. Yeah, Maud, uh, uh, Norman Lear, Maud was great. I, I think people so often underestimate the kinds of ways these, you know, they trivialize the sitcom or comedy in general. But Maud, I, Maud, I, was, I think she, was, she had an abortion. There was an issue of an abortion on that series. I mean, a lot of these series pushed at at limits, they took a lot of risks, and and Maud Beatrice Arthur was totally a total unruly woman in the way she presented herself. Um, and I love comedy, and uh, because I think in both in film and in television, comedy really does make a place for strong women who just uh, they they don't play by the rules, and comedy gives them permission um, to just toss those rules aside, and and that's one reason why I, I say. Feminist film studies was really fixated on melodrama when I started to work in film studies, and it was just they, they had taken it as far as you can go with melodrama. And um, I think there's so much more power and uh, pleasure in comedy for me. I love a good melodrama, but um, I think politically 
you cannot underestimate um, what is, is possible with comedy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, comedy is, is one of those things that it's like you can just, you can write it off as like, oh yeah, I just watched that in my spare time to have fun, but it's, it's so deep and you can really say a lot. Um, so we have a question. What was your reaction to Wonder Woman 1984? Oh yeah, I, um, well, what can I say? I, I, I think, I, <laughs> what can I say? I was, I was disappointed in it because for a couple of reasons, I thought about it. Um, I think part of it was watching it on a, my television. It's supposed to be in a big theater. And I believe in seeing big movies and big theaters and that kind of genre to watch that on my little puny television was really, really bad. So um, a, spect a spectacle like that needs a big screen, needs a good sound system. So that's the first problem. The second, I think, um, uh, I think it kind of pushed at the limits of what the genre can do. Um, you know, in that superhero action genre, you can only go so far. I think it is under underestimated the power of the critique. Uh, Jenkins really, that was so prescient. It's so anticipated. She, she shot that before January 9th. And to see the icons of DC, she set that in DC. And to see that turned into this post-apocalyptic nightmare, and then to have that actually happen, just freaked me out and the uncanny resemblance between that Maxwell Lord and Trump. This was not an accident. I mean, she didn't know that the um, Washington DC was going to go under siege, um, but it's it's uncanny to me that that film, those images, when I watched that film, um, you know, that, that that became a reality and the buffoonery of the villain, um, if you watch that again with Trump in mind, um, the whole thing is a critique of Trump from the opening where she says you can't be a hero if you cheat um, over and over again. And the uh, grifter, the con man, the, the glib, um, uh, the media mogul, the shallowness of the villain is to me a total, it's a total um, uh, uh, portrait of Trump. And also the, I think what's hard about that film is the enemy is not those, those dangerous Germans in, you know, World War II and, or no, it's World War I in the first one. Those others that are so easily villainized, the enemies are us in Wonder, in Wonder Woman 84. It's American greed. It's capitalism. It's capitalism run muck. It's the desire to attach ourselves to a cult figure. It's the desire for more, more, more. So I think I think that critique is very powerful and it's very close to home. Um, as I say, it was too long. There's just the first one was too long for me, too much action. But uh, you know, I think she she I think she was making as just maybe even a more um, a more telling critique in that film. You know, not a perfect film, and it's not my genre. But I'd be interested in what does anybody have any other reactions? I haven't talked to any anybody about Wonder Woman. I mean, most people just shrug it off as a really bad film, but I think that's under, I think that's an unfair assessment of the film. And does anybody have anything to say about it or any? Yeah, if anybody um, has, if, if you liked it, didn't like it or what you liked about it, yeah, drop it in the Q&A and um, we can take a poll. I, yeah, I, I was, we, I, I think we talked about this beforehand is, it's, um, I was watching you know, my parents' horrible TV and, you know, my mom was talking in the background and it was like, ah, you know, it was a terrible movie experience. Um, but I, I, I really liked um, seeing a little bit more of young Diana. I thought that was really nice. Um, and, but yeah, it, it was, it was definitely very like Trump era. Yep. Uh, Trump era movie, um, which I liked. And, and I think Pedro Pascal was just so good. He was, I thought he was brilliant. I, and he got, some people didn't, but I agree, Julia. I thought he was amazing in that role. Wow, so we got some thoughts about 1984. Um, what bothered me about Wonder Woman 1984 was that the man in her life had to point out to her 
the right thing to do. That's interesting. I didn't actually think about that. What do you think? Well, um, I, yeah, I, I agree. But you know, I think one of the things I also think Patty Jenkins is generous to men in a way that I think is also part of the appeal, um, the wide appeal of this as a feminist film. Um, she lets, she, she is not, she doesn't um, make all the men terrible and she doesn't make Diana totally right all the time. So people complain about the first one too, that Steve, Steve Trevor, is that his name, um, guided her into the world. But I think there's some generosity there. It, it, it didn't, um, and it shows a certain kind of vulnerability. I think there's a relatability in that character that you see her torn uh, by love. And that's another way that women audiences, um, it humanizes her. She, in the end, does the right thing. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I don't see that really as a flaw, but more as a way of kind of humanizing, humanizing her and being, allowing a space for a male here. I mean, it was strange, the kind of conceit they used to bring him back. It's a little bit, you know, imaginative, but um, I, yeah, I, I can see where people, people were annoyed about that in the first one too, but I, I just see that as a way of, you know, popular culture lets, lets audiences have their cake and eat it, which is why it is popular. You know, you can, you can have this strong feminist, but message but you know she still likes pretty clothes and she's you know it, it allows you to live in that contradiction and that's why it's popular and maybe this you know deferring to the male giving the male an opportunity to be heroic um is another way of not saying you can be wonder woman and still there's room for men uh, as long as they let you do what you want to, or not let you as long as i mean you're going to do what you're going to do anyway so that's my response to that. But I, I understand um, that criticism. Yeah, I think it, it touches on your earlier point about, you know, people being disappointed that Wonder Woman wasn't a more feminist film. And it's like, well, it, it, you can't, like, what is that? <laughs> and, and, I, and I think that, you know, the per, any woman that Patty Jenkins carried such an enormous weight of representation. Spike Lee did that back in the day when he started making his films. And, you know, any first person, the, the, the early queer film makers, they're expected to do the perfect representation for these identities that are complex and varied. So um, it's, it's a big, heavy weight. Um, you know, what is a feminist film? I couldn't tell you. Uh, there are so many feminisms. <laughs> All right, so we'll do one more question. Um, so this question, I'm just going to paraphrase. Um, so they bring in, they, they bring up, uh, so talking about more subtle narratives in the first film in, in Wonder Woman. Um, one example is using Ludendorff's, uh, Ludendorff's using of, of Dr. Poison, so that kind of manipulation. Um, and then his all-powerful predatory stare at Diana as she stepped into the, the gala. Did you notice these things? And if so, what was your reaction? And I, I will say, just to jump in, like that, that feeling of walking into a room as a woman and feeling people looking at you, I think that is something that so many people can relate to. You know, well, that and I predatory. resurrect that scene. Ricky, tell me a little bit more what happens in that scene. So this is this is the one where she's uh, she stole the dress from that woman, and she's walking in with the sword. Um, oh right, 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 right. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and drawing, drawing, drawing the gaze is. Um, I mean that I think women know what that feels like um because on the street especially public space on the street uh the vulnerability of being the object of the gaze is all the time is there all the time so i'm sure um, patty jenkins was highlighting that um as, as well as flipping it around um 
Uh, but yeah, that, that, that so much film theory is about how women are controlled by the male gaze. Uh, real women in the real world, out, especially out in public space. You, I was always taught, you know, you walk in public spaces with your eyes straight ahead. You know, you don't make eye contact um, and men can control just as laughter, you know, laughter can control people. Um, but the gaze is a way again of keeping women living narrow lives, careful, careful lives um, on guard. Um, all right. Okay. What well, one, one more comment, uh, question. Uh, I actually appreciate it. This is from Barbara. I actually appreciated the partnership between a good man and a good woman. Women who seek power should not have to pay for it by sacrificing relationships. Men do not have to make that choice to be successful. They, they get to have it all without having to kill themselves to do it. So yeah, just another comment about the, the popular, you know, let, letting you have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, I, think, I think that's why the film really was so struck such a nerve. And, and I do think it's a generous, it's a generous vision. It's, there's a kind of utopianism, which I think is essential. We, we really need to be able to imagine a world in which men and women, people of all, you know, men and women and, and that human beings of all in all their differences can partner, they can live in communities together. We, we've got to have these thought experiments where we can figure out how to, to live that way. Um, I should mention that um, I, 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 I so enjoyed going back to this. If anybody wants to see the fuller version of this, um, it's available online um, in uh, a journal called Jump Cut. So um, the, the, the images and, uh, and some of the, a lot of the material about, um, you know, there's a lot, a lot more information that I, I um, glossed over tonight, but if you are interested in more of the figures about women directors and so on, and more wonderful quotes from uh, Cameron and so on, that's all online for you. I just posted Thank that you. link in the Thank chat you. if anybody, <laughs> if anybody wants to do some, some Wednesday night reading, it really is fascinating. Totally, totally fascinating. All right. So we, we've gone a little over, but that's okay because we started late and it was such a fascinating discussion. Um, so thank you for, for the people who stuck around and um, thank you, Kathleen, so, so much. This was so interesting. Um, so uh, for everybody who's still here, our next cinema and conversation is March 17th, and this will be a discussion with the filmmaker Lance Edmonds, who directed Bluebird, which is available, I think, on Amazon Prime for streaming, as well as uh, you can rent it or buy it any way you want. Um, and Bluebird was set in Maine and filmed in Millinocket, I believe. Um, so that'll be really interesting. And uh, make sure to tell a friend that it's happening and tell a friend to register. Um, so, yeah, so thank you so much, Kathleen, and everybody uh, have a have a good night and read read this article. <laughs> well, thank you, Julia and Mike, um, for organizing this series and for inviting me. And um, good night to you all. Thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.